when I started out, it was like, all right, how do we, you know, how do we make a hundred grand? How do we make 200 grand? Once I did that, then it was like, okay, let's, how do we shoot for the millions? Once I did that, then it's like, all right, we don't even know what we want anymore. Cause we didn't even think we were going to be here in the first place. Welcome everyone to the Words of Wisdom a podcast. We are back once again. We're still here in Miami and we're still the number one trading podcast in the world. The fastest growing thanks to all of you and our incredible guests. Talking of, talking of which, we have an absolute legend with us today. We've been in talks for a while. We finally made it happen here in Miami. And that is the one and only Sang Lucci. What's going on, man? It's an absolute pleasure to have you, man. How, how are you? Thanks for inviting me, man. I'm, I'm well, man. Fresh off a trip from, from Colombia yeah. and here, to, here in Miami to do this podcast with Riz. I appreciate it. I really do. You kind of lucked out with the name there, man. Riz. Now all, <laughs> the, now all the kids are saying this stuff. It's really weird, actually. Yeah, it's, a, <laughs> it's fortunate and unfortunate because the funny thing is um, I don't have any Riz, even though my nickname is Riz. So. <laughs> It doesn't work out too well. It, it works out and it doesn't at the same time. <laughs> my daughter and all her friends, my daughter's 18, she uses that word. I'm like, what the hell are you guys talking about? Riz. And then somebody told me it was short for charisma. And then I was like, okay, okay. now this makes I didn't know that. <laughs> now this makes sense. So you got all the Riz, my friend, with the Riz podcast. <laughs> I, know. I think just in the podcast, that's all I've got it for. And that's it. But, um, outside in life, completely mute. Um, but... Sang Lu well, I don't know how to, what was it, Sang Luchi? Sang Luchi, yeah. yeah. So my, my real name is Anand Sangvi and um, born in India. And um, I took half of my last name, Sang Sangvi. And I, I joined it with a, a phrase that's commonly referred to as money in, I guess, back in the days. Um, and, I, and, and the reference was Luchi. So the song, it was a, it was a 90s hip hop song called Luchini. And the, the chorus went, Lucini falling from the skies, let's get rich, what? And <laughs> I took the Lucci and put it on there. And that's, it works. Yeah, it yeah. works. Yeah, man. You know, I love it. I lo everyone loves the, the origin story. You know? Of course. You got the Riz, I got the Lucci. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> and um, talking of origin story, we just take it very briefly. I know a lot of people do know your story, but for just those who don't. Sure. Um, we could just take it back there because you've been trading. Most people who come on the podcast and most people we call, sort of see online um, on social media, a lot of the time they've been trading either during COVID or just before that. I noticed, yeah, a lot of your guests are, are younger. They're, yeah. they're, they're, they're a lot younger. Um, I started trading in 2006, Wow. you know, and coming out of college, I had a financial, I had a, I had a financial background. I had a job as a financial analyst at a medical company. They sold dialysis machines and uh, I was just doing st staff accounting and financial reporting. And it was horrible. I hated it. I hated it so much. I just had my daughter and, you know, I kind of settled into that comfortable nine to five life where you go to work, you sit in traffic for two hours, you go to the gym, you make dinner and that's it. You know, that's it. Play with the kid, of course. And, <laughs> you know, that's it. That's the end of your day. And it was cool, I guess, for a while. And I just got I got so bored. I got so bored. And. During, I've always been an entrepreneur of sorts. I had a painting business in school. Uh, I was selling concert tickets as well. So I was flipping a lot of uh, uh, concert tickets and PlayStation 3s, whatever I could get my hands on that had a secondary market to it. Um, I was always into that and stumbled upon the stock market after just looking online at what was then called proprietary trading firms, the real proprietary <laughs> trading firms, not what they call these days. And I'll, sp I'll explain the difference. Proprietary trading firm is where basically you, you, you bring some of your own money, let's say it's a couple of grand, $5,000, and that's your buy-in, and the firm gives you uh, access to technology, they give you education, they tell you how to trade, they teach you how to trade, and then, you know, they start you off slowly, but you're trading real money, you're, you're trading real money, and if you take a hit and you take an L, you lose more than what you put in, they'll take, they'll stomach it for you, and they'll make money off of commissions and and um, desk fees and things like that. Now, fast forward to today, you can't make money off commissions. Commissions are going to freaking zero. So that, that business just didn't work anymore. Plus, nobody's making any money anyway, so there's no percentage you can take off of, you know, a couple of, there was only a couple of good traders. Um, 2007, they had what was called the uptick rule, 
and they got rid of the uptick rule. So basically what that is, is, is you can only short a stock on the uptick. So let's say Apple is trading 160 bucks and you could only, you could only get short at $160 and one cent. Mm -hmm. So somebody had to buy you out. You can't just, you can't just hit a bid and go short mm -hmm. just like you can today. Um, so the firm was predominantly short based traders. 2007, they got rid of the uptick rule and nobody knew how to go long. 2008, market crashes and nobody in that office survived. I was the only, I was one of the only survivors. Wow. I made a bunch of money shorting the market in 2008. And, um, you know, 2009, my father and I went on a pretty big run. My father, astute engineer, as, as most Indians, as most Indians are, <laughs> um, he lost, a, he lost a good amount of his money in 2008. And luckily, I was coming into a world where I could, I could finally understand it. I was trading for about a year and a half. And, um, you know, I took some of his money, took my money, and we did pretty well. So that was kind of my origin story, so to speak. That's incredible. And yeah. like, what gave you the, the foresight or the insight you yeah. know, for the 2008 sort of trades? Because a lot of people obviously got completely wiped out at that time. Well, look at it this way. The owners of my firm... Um, they were buying Bear Stearns on the way down. They were buying J.P. Morgan. They were buying everything on the way down. They couldn't believe it. And if fast forward to today, and I'll make an interesting reference to it. When you're stuck with decades of, of programming, of how markets work and how they should work and what you have seen in the past, you can't see something new for what it is. You're always going to you're always gonna go on the contrary and because you can't believe it bear stearns was trading at 160 dollars one day the next day it opened up at 80 dollars. it closed at 50. the next day it went it, it opened up at two dollars <laughs> it opened up at two dollars and you're talking about the wealth of the world here stuck in that one stock and a couple of different stocks the 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 owners of my firm they were buying it all the way down we were expecting to go to come into work the next day and doors locked doors locked couldn't get in Really? And they told everybody on the way down while this shit was, was happening, they told everybody on the way down that, don't worry, we're fine, you know, nothing's going to happen. And <laughs> we so literally overnight. Just came in so. overnight, literally a couple days later, couldn't come in. And uh, so did you just have a, a sense or like a feeling that it was something Yeah, different? yeah. I learned my path. My path is panic. When I see panic, I can read it really well. It's very simple to read on the tape. When you're looking at buyers and sellers on the tape, this is, this is how I analyze the markets. I just look at tape. I look at level two. Um, it's just panic. You can feel it. You can, you can read it. It's easy. Everybody, no matter what, if there's any bid to get out on, somebody's going to smoke it because somebody's got, somebody's, there's so much fear. They have to get out. And if you can't get out now, the market's going to close. There's no way, you know, that, that, that palpable fear that you can, you can catalog. It's kind of like what's happening on the other side right now with semiconductor stocks like SMCI, NVIDIA, AMD. I don't know if any of you guys are trading these things, um, but that's what's happening right now. And guys like me who, let's just say we, we make our money during the bear markets, all that talk for this year as well as the uh, last year about the economy doing horrible and us going into a recession and this inflation being a horrible problem and commercial real estate, nobody has, you know, nobody, no, there's no offices open anymore. We're over here waiting for the shoe to drop and waiting for all this to collapse. Meanwhile, nobody gives a shit. Nobody cares. Inflation's going to the moon. I don't know if you guys have, have been to Miami. I went to eat a coat last night. I went to eat a coat last night, the steakhouse. It was a $900,000 meal for two people. <laughs> for two people. I come back from Colombia, by the way. Colombia, you get the same meal, the same quality meal for like 150 bucks over there in Colombia. But again, inflation is a real thing. Nobody gives a shit. And everybody's buying AI stocks and everybody's buying semiconductors. Like this stuff never happened. And it's all good. Everything's fine. So the same thing can happen on the converse mm -hmm. where a guy like myself who has decades of experience can be stuck on the wrong side, hoping for something to happen and trying to understand a market that he can't understand. Definitely. So same thing can happen. So that, that bias sets in depending on what you think you know mm -hmm. about the market. Do you feel like because of all these issues that we're seeing and really something else should be happening and we're seeing the complete opposite, 100%. do you feel like it's just when the penny does drop, but it see, drops big? Again, now, we, now we're talking about a timing thing. Mm -hmm. And now, as every trader knows, this is the most important piece of any trading strategy, of any trading uh, uh, analysis or whatever. Everything is about timing. You might be right, 
But if you're three years too early, nobody gives a shit, and you lost all your money trying to shoot for it, you know? Or you can't stay solvent. It's like uh, the, the, what was the show? The Michael Burry one, the movie, The Big Short? The Big Short, yeah. So the whole thing was they were short well before the shoe dropped, but they couldn't stay solvent because the cost of holding that short sucked up all their money. And when the actual move did happen, they didn't make any money, you know? Those things can happen. So timing becomes the only factor. But now... Look at it this way. If you're waiting for a shoe to drop and it never happens and you're a trader, meanwhile, there's other opportunities that you could be, you could be, you could be making money on mm -hmm. and you're sitting on the sidelines just twiddling your thumbs like, and three years goes by and you're like, well, what the, what the hell do I have to show for it kind of thing? So that's how you kind of have to be as a trader. You have to be able to adjust. You have to be able to step outside of what you think you know or what you think is working or should work to be able to see what's happening as it really is, right? Most yeah. people project what they want on a market that doesn't give a shit about, markets don't give a shit about what you think. Mm -hmm. It's about what is, it's about the tape, it's about who's buying and who's selling and that's it, that's it. Once you overlay your wants and desires, you're screwed, man. Definitely. And uh, you mentioned, you put out a tweet mm -hmm. in December, which absolutely went out to almost a million people. Yeah. Which is insane. And, yeah. um, you know, you were sharing something that most traders just don't share. They just don't, they don't want to be as open, I guess. I don't know yeah. why maybe most traders don't share that. But you mentioned about losing a seven-figure account. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And what was, what was the, the process of that? What was the sure. sort of uh, recovery of that, if you will? Okay, okay. Well, let me ask you something. You talk to a lot of traders. Yeah. What do you think, after doing all these podcasts, what do you think about why people don't, don't show their losses or don't talk about their losses? Still in a game that is based off of P&L, gains, wins, and losses. You know, what do you think it is? I'm interested to hear. What I would think. imagine that a lot of the time, as I was saying in terms of the social media space, a lot of people have been trading over the, let's say, mainly on the social media scene once it's been a big thing. Sure. And therefore they have an image to protect, if that sure. makes sense. Or there's this idea that traders have to be perfect or yeah. the good traders yeah. are perfect traders. Yeah. And therefore that does, the real bad thing about that is that then seeps into all the new traders. And that's what they think. They think that that's what trading is. And sure. therefore they always go on this journey of searching for perfection, that there's a strategy that exists out there mm. that is perfect, mm. that allows you to read the, the market like a book. So when you look at it, you go, oh, it's going to go long, then short, then long. And uh, I think that's what it is. I think it's just the guise of marketing and the guise of perfectionism and that if you lose, you're not a good trader. Sure. And therefore, there is very few traders I have interviewed who share those. And the interesting thing is, I would say in Forex, it's a really big issue. While when I do speak to a lot more options traders, they've been showing their P&Ls yeah. and, and maybe not all of them, but a couple that I have uh, interviewed, they're very more vocal about their losses yeah. and uh, showing their P&L statements versus in the FX side that I come from, it seems to be very much uh, <laughs> a very not talked about subject and right. not really any losses or very few losses being shown. Let's take a break for a minute there, guys, because I want to tell you about the best trading tool on the market, TradeZella. The reason why TradeZella is the number one trading tool that every trader needs is because you can do backtesting, automated journaling, trade replay, in-depth analytics, and so much more. And the greatest part about TradeZella is that it's all automated. All you have to do is connect your MT4 and MT5. It will pull all your data onto the dashboard. You can add playbooks, you can just add notes, you can add images from your trades, and you can get the insights that is necessary for you to progress as a trader. Now, TradeZella is for absolutely everyone. Whether you're a crypto trader, whether you're a Forex trader, whether you trade prop firms, it is for absolutely everyone. And that is why thousands of traders have signed up using my link here through the podcast. Make sure you use the code RIZ10 for 10% off your monthly subscription or WOR for 20% off your yearly subscription. The link is in the description below. And let's get back to the episode. Remember, you got to sell stuff. And remember, I'm, I've been in this world for a long time. And I know, the back, I know the back ends of every brokerage. I know who's behind them. I know the guys behind them. And it's a small community. When you talk about high-level finance, you're talking about Chicago, you're talking about New York, and you're talking about London and a couple other places. But beyond that, everybody knows each other. Mm -hmm. 
this whole funded simulation thing, this simulation uh, funded account, I don't even know what the hell you call them here at this point. There's so many different names and there's so many different platforms for them. I know the guys that are behind it. And I know the, I know the why. Because if you came from a prop firm background where you're funding actual traders with your actual money, think about the risk that you're putting up, right? It's like, and think about the numbers. I know all the guys that are behind the funded simulation accounts, the, the top step traders of the world, the, 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 what are some of the other big ones? The FTMOs, yeah. the, the, you know, you name it. Uh, funded trader, simu I don't know. All these, <laughs> all these different ones, for, true Forex funds. All the guys that are behind this stuff are the same guys that were behind the prop firms that existed before. Mm -hmm. And now look at the model. You don't have to put up your own risk capital. You know from data perspective from years ago, 95% of those traders do not make any money. So you're making $100 or $200 every single month off every single one of these traders to try when they're trying to get a funded account. Even when the 5% that try to get a funded account or, or achieve a funded account, they don't actually get a payout. They continue to roll profits because they want to make more until they eventually blow out. And then the small 1% that actually do, there's enough cash sitting around here so you can pay these people out. And now they're getting even smarter on when they pay, pay people out. So sometimes they'll, they'll, they'll block accounts if you're making too much money. There's all kinds of stuff going on here. So basically all we're talking about now is pure math. This is all pure math now that is happening here behind the, behind the scenes of these things. Um, you know, so when it comes to losses, I know for a fact from the broker side of it, and the brokers know everything. They have all the data here. I know all the brokers, and they tell me the same thing. <laughs> like we see people blowing out every single day. But then you go on Instagram, and everybody's everybody's doing amazing. Everybody's doing amazing, and the 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 desire to uh, join somebody's room or join somebody's Discord or join somebody's course because you think they have the they have what it you know they have the the golden nuggets so to speak has never been more high than I've seen it, and in in you know I it's in record what is happening right now. And the volumes for every single trading product is going through the roof. Yep. Gambling, uh, online gambling and all that kind of stuff. I don't know if you guys have seen DraftKings or some of these other stocks here. It's through the roof here. Um, and the Super Bowl with the amount of bets here that came in for the Super Bowl, same thing. So this level of activity for trading, short-term trading and for gambling and all that kind of stuff, it's at all-time highs. And you go on Instagram, everybody's making money. Mm -hmm. But the brokers from the real side of it that are behind all those platforms, they'll tell you right now, everybody's losing money. You know? So it's kind of interesting. <laughs> it's it's kind of interesting. I think it's, would you say from your experience, because again, most traders coming into the market, I started trading in 2016. Sure. And I think that's, for the social media side of things, that's like sort of the on the higher end, a lot more people coming in during COVID. Sure. Just pre, just post. Sure. Um, so we haven't seen maybe... The changes has that always been the case? Have people always been that way, or has that been? Something it's always been the case. A hundred percent, it's always been the case. Um, and I don't want to dodge your your question here. I came out publicly and said, you know, I blew out a, a several seven figure account, and you know what I was trying to do? I was trying to short. I was trying to short every step of the way because I couldn't understand. I couldn't. I couldn't. I couldn't accept the valuations for some of these companies. I couldn't accept what was going on here. I wanted to project what I felt like should be happening, and you get so heavy into an emotion or a bias. Sometimes you can't see what's happening until it's a little bit too late. And once it's too late, now there's a whole new set of emotions to deal with because now you got losses to make back. Now you want to make back losses, right? Now there's the emotions to making back losses means you'll go, you'll push the line even more mm -hmm. just to make back a loss. So you might take an extra risk or things like that. And remember, you're still not reading the market in the correct state of mind. So it doesn't matter how good you get, how many millions of dollars you get or make, you're always at risk of yourself at some point in time because of the things that you have going on in your life. Maybe you need the money for X, Y, and Z at that moment in time. I, I meet so many traders that are going through a divorce and those periods are the worst times in their trading, uh, you know, history. Um, or they got a business that's folding and they need to survive. Or they need to survive somehow. So they take a little bit more risk on the trading side. You're no longer reading the market at that point. You're just you're just hoping you're just you're really just hoping. And you come to the market with that kind of mindset subconsciously. You think you're going there to read shit. Maybe you can for a little bit, but you'll lose yourself in the bias at some moment in time. 
So that's what happened to me, man. And it because of when things are going well for me, I tend to add the weight of the world on my shoulders in the sense of, you know, starting new businesses and things like that and going for more and going for more and going for more. I have a story of this one guy, this one guy who started in the pits out in Chicago and he was an amazing trader, man. And I watched him go from zero to 80 million to zero to 80 million to zero to 80 million like three or four times. And his, fa his father finally came into uh, the equation and was like, all right, every time you make 20 million or 30 million or something, we're gonna take 10 out and we're just gonna buy some real estate. And eventually this guy ended up making a billion dollars trading. Wow. Just trading, you know? When you think about this, like, can you make a billion dollars trading? Yes, 100%. You can see it on the screens every single freaking day. You see what's happening in a lot of these big picture moves that happen in the markets. For example, the, the semiconductor uh, industry right now. People have made a significant amount of money trading NVIDIAs and the AI stocks mm -hmm. of the world. At some point, it's going to be a great short, and you're going to see the same amount of money being made on the, on the short side as well. I say all that to say that the emotions, it doesn't matter what level of the game you are, whether you're $100 trading or $1,000 trading or you're at $100 million, the same thing happens. You're always at risk. You're always at the most risk to yourself. You know, you were the reason, you know, why, you know, these things happen at those, at those moments. And of course, and depending on what you have going on in your life, depending on what your wants and desires are, we often tend to dump that on a market that doesn't give a shit. So most of the time we want more, like I said, you're trying to make back losses and things like that, and that gets you into a little bit of trouble. So that's what happened to me, and it's no different than any other trader. So yeah. the process to get back, what that looks like is you have to let it go first. You, ha you have to accept what happened. You have to. There's no other choice. Because if you come to the market with that weight on your shoulders and that shame, so to speak, and that, uh, you know, the weakness, because mm -hmm. it, it, that's what we're talking about, these emotions and these feelings that you have about yourself. If you come to the market with that, market's gonna, market's gonna steamroll you all day, you know? So there's a level of confidence that you need, but you can't get that confidence if you're still living in the past. Yeah. You can't get it, you can't find it, it ain't gonna happen. So you have to accept where you are, and that's a very difficult thing to do. It takes a, takes a good amount of time for a certain type of person. If you're a very mentally strong person, it might take a couple of weeks, you know? If it takes you longer, you might be sitting in your house depressed for a couple of years, Maybe you have to go back to work a little bit to scrounge up some cash and you got to do what you got to do. But the acceptance part is the toughest part. Once you accept it, then you are where you are. You start where you start. You start with whatever chips you have. If you still got chips and you got a chair, the game is still the game. Definitely. And in terms of acceptance, is there like actual procedure or anything like that? Or is it more so just however long it takes to actually accept it? You know, this is a great question. It's a great question because it's, it's difficult to answer, right? In the sense of everybody will say, okay, the discipline will solve the emotional problems, right? Because if you come to any game with the same discipline, without the emotion, so to speak, and you just do what you have to do, you should be okay. In trading, you could be disciplined. What does discipline look like in trading, right? Does it look like you're just showing up to work every day? Or does it look like you need to control the decisions that you make every single day? That's what the discipline should look like in trading, whereas you minimize the bad decisions and things like that. But how do you minimize the bad decisions if you're still stuck in the past? Subconsciously, you ain't gonna do it. it does, I don't care who you are, unless you're a robot and you got code here, it takes a while to figure out what subconsciously is moving the reason why you're making certain decisions. Mm -hmm. And you have to tackle that. And I think no matter what, that takes time. And it takes time, it takes pressure, and it's resistance. So you kind of keep having to push up on that wall of resistance until you, you get so fed up with yourself. <laughs> it's almost like you hate yourself because that's what it feels like sometimes. And then you start to make the, the incremental changes that you need to make every single day. It's not a one, it's not a, it's not a switch all of a sudden that happens over a certain period of time. It's a constant pushing up on resistance, failing, 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 and continuing to go, 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 until you slowly work out some of the bad habits that you've been, that you've been you know, subconsciously programmed yourself to do for the last God knows how many years. Definitely. That takes time. I could only imagine that. It takes time. In terms of your career, one thing that I find interesting is a lot of traders, they have a mindset of trading forever. 
sure right? their whole life right and, and that's very respectable but in your in your career have you seen in terms of like numbers for example do the mass, vast majority of traders come into the game and even if they are profitable they, they make profits but then they they sort of leave and the the ones who do trade for that very long period of time are actually far fewer and in between than what most people may think You're much far fewer um you know you wouldn't believe it but i mean again i've been in the game for 20 years so the, what I see nowadays are guys who are my age, 40, 50, um, the ones who are still doing it that are that age and have been doing it for 30 years, you can't do anything else. You know this game so well. You know, you know the inside and outs of this game so well that it's become a part of who you are. It's like coming up, it's like, it's like drinking coffee in the freaking morning. The first thing that you're going to do is take a look at what the gap ups and gap downs are. And, you know, <laughs> and read some news and try to make a couple of plays. We're always going to think like this. A true trader is always going to think like a trader. And what does a trader think like? All we do is sit there and assess what's going on. I mean, here we are. We're, we're, we're at a podcast studio, which happens to be all over Miami and, and, and places in Dubai, where people pay to come here, do all these kinds of feeds, do all these kinds of content. Because right now, what's... What's, where can you turn a dollar into two? Digital, digital content is where it's at. So now all of a sudden, we're here at a freaking, st we're a random studio in the middle of freaking Miami. I've never seen shit like this, but this is what it is. This is what it is, and this is a prominent business, and probably will be for the next five years. So all traders, all we do is just, we sit there and observe. We just observe. We observe and we try to figure out how to make some money off of it. That's it, that's all a trader does in reality. Could a trader run a successful business? Could a trader run several different companies? Could a trader start doing real estate? He could do all of that stuff because all he's doing is observing. That's it. So the evolution of a trader who's been trading for 10 years, 20 years, and continuing to extract profits, it's, those are some of the greatest stories that you'll ever see because they get into the most wildest businesses that you'd never believe in, you'd never even believe existed. And it's all funded by guys who are just like me and you. Guys who just make 10 million, 20 million in the market and go fund other businesses. I've met so many guys my age that are now coming out of trading. They'll still trade a little bit, swing, swing trading and things like that. Um, but they've moved on to bigger, bigger businesses and running large businesses and, and that's it. They say they're a lot more happier because they're not trading <laughs> anymore. Um, but again, running a business is very stressful as well. So. Traders create such a pain resistance. There's such a pain tolerance that we have. Mm -hmm. And I don't think this generation, and again, you know, don't come at me on social <laughs> media or whatever for saying this, but I don't think this generation has a lot of pain tolerance to begin with. And you're talking about guys who are hardened, man. These guys are hard guys that you can't, you can't, you can't, you can't make them angry. You can't make them, you can't, you can't, you can't mess with them, mm -hmm. you know? They'll come back always, always. These are the guys that will always come back because they're harder than any of you, you know? So they're the ones that can really understand and push businesses and things like that. Even the NVIDIA uh, CEO, after the earnings came out, everybody did an interview on him. I forget what his name is. Shang Huang, I think it was, it was his name, the NVIDIA CEO. You know, everybody's giving him this praise because they had the best quarter in the world. Stock goes to freaking 830. Stock goes up 100 bucks in a day. And this guy's like... They asked him if you would do it again, if you would start, if you would start this semiconductor business again. He was like, hell no. <laughs> hell no. It was a million times harder than I ever thought it was. I think I've seen that. Nobody answer. has a clue what you're in for until you're in it. And then once you're in it, you got no choice but to continue. <laughs> and he's like, hell no. I wouldn't wish this on my, on my biggest enemy. Mm -hmm. You know, It's a hard thing that we're doing here. Yeah, definitely. Now, I think I've seen that interview, and it was so interesting to see. And it's, it's so interesting because... People would assume that the mindset would be like, yes, I would do this 10 times more and yeah. 10 times bigger. Yeah. And social media, by the way, it has you feeling and believing and thinking that way. And it's not the reality. It's not the reality of the situation. Social media uses that to sell you a product or to sell you a type of lifestyle or to sell you a way of thinking, you know, that you can. And yes, you can. Nobody's saying you can't. You know, so many things are possible because the human mind has said, yes, I can. That is the whole basis of our existence. We're able to wake up every single day and say, yo, I'm going to go do this shit and you can't tell me shit. That's what we're, we're supposed to come out here and do this because it's a gift. It's a gift that I'm here speaking to Riz right now 
who has no riz apparently, but he'll find <laughs> some because, you know, we have a choice to wake up every day mm -hmm. and figure out what the hell we want to do. It's, it's such a gift. It's such a gift and an opportunity. So even if you lose and you get knocked on your ass, who cares, man? And at the end of the day, you got another shot. So get your ass up and take the fucking shot, you know? Okay. But it ain't, it ain't easy. <laughs> 100%. And what would you, in terms of those traders who are just stepping into the market now? Yeah. You know? So I wouldn't say to you, like, if you could go back, because that would be the same question. Sure. But for those traders coming in, sure. what could you say to them in terms of what to expect? And, yeah. And to have a, a hopefully a long career like yourself. Man, it, it, what would be great if we could see it? And we won't, because again, it's the nature of our humanness. And once you try to marry the world of trading with being human, then you start to understand like what this game really is. Um, to the newer traders that are that are a lot of the guys that I've seen on your on your podcast who are having you know a good amount of success. Mm -hmm. What I'll see, especially here, we're in Miami, man. Last night I'm at the restaurant, and then we go out after, and you know you'll see guys dropping ten grand, twenty grand. Paying for a girl, their girl's apartment because the girl just wants to be on Instagram and all this kind of stuff. Like, that's, that's normal now. That shit is normal, you know? And you're a trader who's making a good amount of money. That's what you're going to do. You're going to come down to Miami. You're going to find a nice girl. You're going to live this kind of lifestyle. To live that lifestyle, you're talking about 20000 a month, 30000 a month overhead. To live like some of these kids want to live with a car, with this, with a great apartment. Some of these apartments here ridiculous two bed two bath you're, pay, you're paying seven grand eight grand right you might as well turn it into a damn studio and make some money <laughs> off of it right so that's the lifestyle that you guys are looking for now what's going to end up happening is you you you're on a nice streak maybe you're making some good money at some point because of the way the world works this is the way we are this is this is human beings shit goes up and shit goes down when it's not there and you got all that overhead what are you going to do what are you going to do? You can't see that coming and you don't want to see it coming because you can't even believe it's going to come. Once you make it and somebody tells you, hey, hey, save some, you know, save some for a rainy day. <laughs> You're looking at him like, what the fuck rainy day are you talking about? I'm young here. I'm 23. You can't tell me shit. 25, whatever the hell it is. When I was that age, you couldn't tell me a damn thing. I had to learn the hard way. You know, so who am I to step in front of these kids and tell them, hey, you know, save some for the rainy day. However, the best traders that I've seen, even the young ones, they have somebody behind them that are, that, are, that are creating a system around them to be like, all right, you just hit a million. You just hit two million. You don't need the full two million to trade. You don't need the whole stack. But they'll say, okay, yeah, I need it because I want to make 10 million. I want to make 15 million. I want to make 20 million. If you continue to just park, take 250 out, take 300 out, obviously think about your taxes. Half the young folks, they won't even think about their taxes. You're in Miami, you're saving on taxes, what, 7%, 11% from where you were before, but I'm in Puerto Rico. I don't pay shit. I pay 0% capital gains. You guys have to think, if you don't think about this, you make a million bucks, you live off of 20,000 a month, by the end of the year, you gotta pay 400 in taxes. You ain't got shit to show for it. It's sad to say it like this because we're talking about a million dollars. Anybody who makes a million dollars, you have the potential to take that million and grow it slowly over time so that you never have to deal with shit. Have, it, have you seen The Gambler with um, Mark Wahlberg and, uh, and I forget what the hell his name was, the big guy. Uh, he was talking about fuck you money, basically. You get up to the point where you make fuck you money, you go get the house, you go get this so that any question anybody ever asks you in future in life, fuck you, I don't have to do anything. I don't have to do this, right? So that's what I would say the most to, to any of the kids here that are, that are listening and you guys have success. Remember, you guys are coming into a market where you don't have the same bias that I do. So you can take a look at NVIDIA and buy that shit and ride it up <laughs> another 100 points tomorrow because it's probably going up another 100 points tomorrow. I can't do that. I'm waiting on this whole <laughs> party to slow down, to stop, so I can short the hell out of it. You guys don't have the same bias that I do. So you can shoot with impunity kind of thing, mm -hmm. um, you know, and with the youthful confidence that you guys have. There's, a, um, there's that blind faith that a lot of the kids have, that, that you have when you're 20 years old, 25 years old. You have blind faith in yourself. You don't give a shit about what anybody says. You're going to do what you're going to do, and you don't care about what anybody says. That blind faith is so powerful, 
it'll project you to some places that you didn't think you can go. Now, when you get there, there's another set of, there's another equation that's waiting for you on that side. Are you the one that's going to keep it and continue to roll? Or are you the one that is going to lose it and we're never going to hear from again? Mm -hmm. And the majority of folks is the, is the latter. The ones who, you know, may, you might make a couple of million bucks, but if you don't make the right decisions when you have it, remember, you're only going to have so many shots to take, right? Because life is life. It's hard. It's hard to keep coming back and shooting after you get your ass kicked, right? Because you still have to get the confidence to get over that, to come back to the game, to do it again, and imagine having to do it again and again and again and again and again. At some point when you get older, you're fucking tired. You're tired. So you want to make smarter moves. And if ever you're sitting on a million bucks, a couple of million bucks, right now there's so much opportunity where you could slowly work that over a period of 10 years into, wow, some serious wealth here, you know, 20 million bucks, $50 million. And you can do it over a slower period in time being a little bit smarter. It's just who's going to learn that lesson if, if they don't learn it themselves kind of thing. You know what I mean? No, it's either you can thing, see yeah. it coming mm -hmm. or it hits you in the face. Definitely. No, that's what I was actually going to ask and follow up on is like, everyone's always searching for a hack to avoid pain, sure. to avoid hardship. Sure. And you think that is really the issue is that you just have to embrace it instead and just hope to learn from it and hope to yes. pick up on the things that are necessary to get that successful. Beautiful success. thing about life. These are the only conversations that I've been having lately. And everybody, it's so easy to say that, hey, you know, you fell on some hardships. It's OK. You're going to be back and all that kind of stuff. But to the individual mind, when he has to go home and he has to go to, to sleep at night, the man can't sleep. Right? What is he going to do? He's going to fill his mind up with all that bullshit rhetoric that he reads in a fucking book? It's, it only works for, it only works to keep you going, right? But you still have to deal with what your, 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 your self-talk. And if that self-talk gets ugly enough, mm. man, you know, it gets, pretty, it gets pretty freaking ugly. And that's a lot of stuff to try to overcome. Um, I believe in the chaos theory, 100%. Mm. It's like something bad has to happen for you to wake up and figure some shit out. So if there's a lesson that you needed to learn, it's gonna come in a hard way. That's what I believe. Because if you look at all the greatest change in the world, it's happened off the back of some, something ridiculously fucked up happening. You know, And that's where all the greatest change happens. That's where all the greatest shifts in economies happen, history, you name it. The way that we think, the way that we talk to each other. All of it has happened back off the backs of something horrible happening. People dying, wars, you name it, man. So why would it be any different for the individual? Mm -hmm. You know? But it's a hard pill to swallow. People don't want to hear that shit. People will pay all kinds of money to avoid it, you know? But what you can't avoid what you can't avoid, you know? Yeah. So no, that's definitely. my that's my theory. Maybe no, it's maybe that. it's more of the negative one and people don't want to hear it, but I yeah. mean, uh, if we look at it, it's kind of what you were saying earlier about you know, most people lose anyway, right? Yeah. And, yeah. But then most people are searching for the opposite where they want the, the hack, the, mm -hmm. you know, the motivational talk. Sure. So maybe there's correlation between the two. Sure. Um, you mentioned a few times now in terms of a bias and you know, you're being yeah. a short seller, for example. And yep. you know, how important is it as a trader to understand your bias and understand what your forte may be rather than, because especially in, let's say, the FX side or... Or just generally, I see a lot of traders, they, they're trying to do both. They're trying to be a long trader and they're trying to be a short trader yep. all at the same time um, versus you know, the sense I'm getting from yourself is like understand your forte, understand your strengths and yeah. focus on that. Yeah. Um, I think it's one of the most important things because especially now, it's so hard to focus on you and what you're good at because every day you wake up and you look at this shit, you see somebody else doing better than you using a strategy that you aren't currently using or that you know for a fact it doesn't even work for you. So sometimes you'll go online and you'll, you'll go in your chat rooms and you'll see guys that are doing a different strategy than you that you already know you can't execute. You've already proven that you can't execute it, but you want that. So you continue doing that shit because of what you see versus looking inside yourself and looking at yourself truly and being like, all right, this is what I'm good at. The rest of this shit... I'm, not, I'm just not good at it. It's my path. It has nothing to do with anybody else's. But when you're eating shit and you need to make some gains, you're desperate for whatever, right? So you'll, you'll try to grab onto whatever you want to um, or whatever looks good at that current moment. So that's the whole process. That's the whole mental process of this game. It's hours and hours and hours, days and days and days of fighting those thoughts, of fighting those desires, of fighting those 
uh, you know, those things that come up. And just telling yourself when you sit down at that computer every day, this is how I'm going to execute. This is what I know I'm good at. I don't give a flying fuck what everybody else is doing. This is what I'm going to do. But to get to that point where you have the confidence that it works and you, or you yourself can execute that, that's the difficult part. That's the part that takes time to get to and the acceptance of who you are. Most people don't want to accept it or even want to do the inner work to figure, out, to figure that stuff out because they're too busy looking at what everybody else is doing and what is working for everybody else, you know? Sometimes if my shit's not working, the best thing that I can do is just step the fuck off. But I, you can't because this is what we do, right? You want to be at the screens every single day because the shot could be there. It could be the day, mm -hmm. you know? So being aware of yourself in this game is the most important thing that you, could, that you could ever do for yourself. And by the way, traders are the only ones that achieve that level of awareness, right? Besides the yogis of the world and the gurus of the world, who, by the way, they sit in these ashrams for the whole day here trying to figure out who the hell they are and trying to analyze every single thought that comes in. And most thoughts that we have are complete bullshit. It doesn't, they're not real. They're just a, a thought that turns into a feeling. And now all of a sudden we have fear, we have greed, we have this, we have that. All of it is useless. It's fucking, it's a trash compactor up there, you know? But most people will latch onto a thought and they'll believe these things about themselves. And that shit ain't true at all, you know? And it takes a while to understand that. Traders, by the way, are the only ones that are faced with having to deal with this problem every single day. And if they don't solve that problem, they don't make money, you know? Yeah. And if you think of most other people in the world who have nine to fives and things like that, they've never been challenged like that to figure out who they are. They define themselves with what they have, their job, this and this and that. They've never had to truly go inside to figure out who they were. Trading is a journey about you. It is, it, is, it is about you 100%. And it takes a while to figure all those things out. In terms of that, like self-awareness, is there any, I know we talked about people having to experience and, and you know, learn as they go along, but in terms of self-awareness, is there anything that you've done in your career to sort of be more self-aware, increase that self-awareness at all? Um, it happens every day. It's a day thing. It's, it's an hourly thing. It's a thought thing. It's practice on what happens up here. So for example, I'll give you an example. Um, this morning I wake up, uh, what are some of the thoughts that I had this morning? This morning I woke up and I had a thought of, um, I should have sold out of a position that I had on Friday before it went south on me. Um, I, I thought about my ex, uh, what else? I thought about, um, I thought about some of the other things that I had to do for, for the businesses that I have and how I'm slacking on a couple of these things. And then you start to feel bad about, you start to feel, you feel bad about things. I woke up this morning, I was like, shit, man. Am I doing everything that I need to be doing here? Um, and I didn't want to wake up. I didn't want to wake up temporarily. And it was just a, and again, this happens over, this, hap this could be seconds, this could be minutes, it could be 20 minutes. And then you go to social media, right? So you, I'll go pick up my phone to distract myself from all the shit that's going on in my head, right? So now I'm on social media and I'm scrolling, I'm scrolling, I'm scrolling. I'm looking at other girls. I'm, I'm looking at some messages that I may have. Um, I'm looking at those, those motivation quotes, of course, <laughs> that you see every single day. I'm analyzing those. And then at the same time, I'm still thinking about all the thoughts that I had before. And it's just a jumble of shit. And I'm just, I don't want to wake up because now I feel crappy and, and 30 minutes goes by, and you're like, well, what the, hell is, what, what the hell is going on? Finally, I'm like, all right, get your ass up, go brush your teeth, and go do some freaking push-ups, you know? I get up, I brush my teeth, I floss, I go do some push-ups. Now, all of a sudden, I feel like a million bucks. I don't have any of those thoughts. And then it's like, all right, I got to go see Riz. What else do I got to do? What else do I got to do? I start setting things up. I start solving problems. And boom, we're in the day, and the day is started. So... It's, a, it's, when you talk about self-awareness, it's a, it's a second to second thing. It's a, it's a, it's a mental analysis of all the shit that's going on up here. And it happens every single second, mm -hmm. but you have to start it. Most people just have the self-talk and they never, they never analyze it. Yeah. It'll just talk. So it's learning to like observe your thoughts exactly. and trying to keep track of them. Not in a way like every single one, cause exactly. there's so many, but it's like you actually being able to recall what happened this morning, exactly. for example, while me, now that you've said it, I can then say, oh, wait, actually, that's probably why I felt this way or that. Yeah. But otherwise, I'll just be on autopilot. 
Yeah. And that's a dangerous place to be. Yeah. You're the watcher. You're, you you want to be the watcher of all this shit up here. Because mm. none of it makes... All of it is, a thought will come in, it'll make you feel like something, maybe you'll feel it for a second, and then if you're able to push it off and send it off and send it off to the heavens and wherever the hell it needs to go and keep on doing what you need to do, that's the discipline, that's the mental discipline that we're talking about here. But it takes a while to get it. And you first have to understand why you want to be aware of it. And why you want to be aware of it is because one thought can turn into an emotion that controls your whole day, that controls your whole week, that controls your whole month, it's, it's put people out of commission for their whole fucking lives, man. Yeah. To the point where you don't even have a life anymore. Mm -hmm. You're a slave to this. And once you become a slave to this, you're not even alive. Remember, it's a gift. This is insane here mm -hmm. that we're doing this podcast. All this is insane here that I lost money and made money. This is, it's fucking nuts. Mm -hmm. So the true gift and the value of all of this is that we can do this. If you stop doing this, you're dead. I think it's a very powerful thought because at the end of the day, I think for general life, it's very important to be self-aware. But then when we talk about trading, as you just sort of touched on there, um, you know, one emotion can just lead on to the next to the next. And yeah. then in trading, unfortunately, because of the money that we're dealing with, yeah. that one thought can be catastrophic. <sighs> because we, we attach our value to the money that we make or don't make. And it's one of the biggest problems. But... I wouldn't even consider it a problem. It is what it is. We're in the game to make money. We're in the damn game to make money. Stop talking like we aren't in the game to make money. That's what you got into this shit for. You know, stop trying to be holier than now and say, you, you know, you're not in it for the money. You're in it for freedom. Well, what the fuck gets you the freedom in the first place? It's the money, right? And then when you get that freedom, you know what you, you, know what you realize? You're still a slave to the markets and you don't have the fucking freedom that you set out to get. So it's all bullshit anyway that we try to sell ourselves, right? And these are all the thoughts and these are all the emotions that trap us into doing God knows what, mm -hmm. you know, the amount of dumb mistakes that we'll all make. But again... What's dumb in reality if this life is meant for that? You know what I mean? So that's, that's, we could go on for a while. On I could imagine, yeah, no, but I'm sure like a lot of people, at the end of the day, trading psychology or trading mindset or just mindset as a whole, yeah. it's such a powerful thing because it controls and dictates pretty much our whole lives, as you said. Yeah. Um, but one thing you did touch on there, which I thought was very, very interesting, actually, because this is something I've always toyed with in terms of passion, uh, especially for trading. Sure. Because... I've spoken to a lot of people on podcasts and off, and a lot of the time I've come across people and they're like, I'm passionate for money, Yeah, you know? Yeah. And I get it, as, as you said, like money is so important, that's why we get into trading. Yeah. But do you feel like you have to have a passion for the markets as well to really be a successful trader, or is that not really too important? Yeah, I think you, I think you have to have a general desire for both. I don't think it's as necessary though, it, it's as high on the bar here. If you have a passion for money, you know, you can make things happen in a lot of different ways. You know, you can, you can dissect different games and play a lot of different games to make that money. The problem is, is if money is your only desire, then it starts, it starts pushing you towards making decisions that, that are unhealthy, that are very unhealthy, and it starts attracting other consequences here in your, in your life and, and with the people that you know and the people that you love. You, you'll start doing a lot of things that are morally that don't sit right with yourself, mm -hmm. that now you're gonna have to pay for at some point in time. And you know, for folks who believe in karma at all, or if they do, or if they don't, it is what it is. But again, if you, if you have to step on somebody to get more money, or you have to screw something over, or you have to, you know, if you gotta do those things, that shit's gonna come back on you and you're gonna feel a certain way about it. Because remember, we are humans, we do have feelings, that's the beauty of being a human, we do have these emotions. And at some point, you're going to have to pay for, for, for those decisions that you made. So I do think having just the goal of, of money is not, is not enough. Mm -hmm. And they'll realize it sooner or later anyway. Because even once you taste money, Dave Chappelle said it the best. When he went on the Letterman show, he was like, what's the difference between $10 million and $50 million? And he was like, you know, say I got $10 million. I'm at a restaurant and there's a guy over there. He's, he's, eating, he's eating the same meal as I am, but he's got $50 million. The difference in lifestyle, he said, is, is minuscule, you know? The only difference is, and this was his joke, the only difference is, in a, is in an astounding $40 million. <laughs> and it was incredible, because Chappelle is a way, is, is a, is, he's an amazing comedian, mm. but he's also kind of like a motivational speaker at the same time. Yeah. And he'll put shit so simply for you. But again, like, once you hit these levels, 
you know, for example, like I don't have to have 10, 20 million to have the friend circle that, that I have. They got all the shit that I want anyway. So I could just call them up and be like, yo, can I use your boat? Can, yo, can I use your this or can, you know, you're gonna have access to it anyway. Do you really need one yourself? You know, what are you trying to accomplish here? I, you know, if you're trying to make a billion dollars, if you're trying to make a hundred million dollars and things like that, these are doable, you know, but what do you want it for? And what is the whole purpose? You got to figure out and align yourself out with, with that. But once you achieve a good amount of money, you're able to taste a lot of these things that everybody is. And once you taste it the first time, it's like, all right, what's next? You know, there's always going to be a next thing. You're always going to be lacking purpose, so to speak. Even if you make another million dollars, the value of that million dollars is not million. Do it's not a million dollars anymore. It might be the value of a hundred thousand. It might be the value of a freaking ten thousand. Um, you know, so that's the issue with aligning yourself just with the money. Mm -hmm. You know, you got to have some kind of a deeper purpose. And of, of course, if you love the markets and if you love the game of it, you'll go far, man. Because you'll never, you know, you'll never want to do anything else anyway. Mm -hmm. It's like figuring out a jigsaw puzzle, like the most complicated jigsaw puzzle that ever has existed and that has no winner and that has no end to it whatsoever. And you can never beat this game 100% straight up. Um, you said something interesting about the emotion stuff. I know some guys who are just um, automated traders, 100% automated traders, and they'll tell you straight up, like, human, like, the trading psychology is complete bullshit, you know? And you got to have some of these guys on your podcast. I would love to see them. You know, I would love to see the back and forth because um, I'll get in it. I'll get into it with these guys all the time. I even employed. I had a, a hedge fund where I employed some ex UBS and Goldman Sachs guys when I was in New York. Mm -hmm. And these guys were great coders. They, you know, they coded a lot of strategies for the big banks, and you know, they were making millions of dollars every single year. And when they had to go on themselves without the bank's capital, couldn't make a dime. Couldn't make a dime. And these are the best programmers in the fucking world, man. These are physics guys. Mm -hmm. These are engineers who have created, you know, all kinds of stuff. Smartest people in the world. You still are your code. You still are your strategy. Your mm -hmm. code has to be good enough to make some money. Somebody is out there looking for the same edge that you have. So if you're out there making money on whatever strategy you have, eventually that shit ain't gonna work anymore. It's just the science of what we do. Because somebody's gonna realize, hey, there's a lot of money being made over here. Mm -hmm. Let's scrape it here and let's figure this out. Let's change this or, or there's too many people in the, pot, in the pool and it doesn't, it doesn't work anymore. And you have to switch it up. So even the best coders in the world, they still have to write, they still have to continue to write code. Mm -hmm. They still have to continue to check it. They're still at the same risk as, as a retail guy. It's very interesting what you touched on there because a lot of people, or at least on my side of the industry, they are a lot of strategies being promoted as these are the bank strategies, sure. the institutional strategies. Sure. And, uh, they throw that word around real, real easy now, mm -hmm. man. That, uh, that used to upset me. You know, you see these one month in, two month in Forex traders, and they'll put on their accounts, we're institutional traders. Like, bitch, what the fuck told you? Who the <laughs> fuck told you that you are an institutional trader? What do you, where did you even get that word? Mm -hmm. You know, continue, my bad. No, no, that's it. That was it. I was going <laughs> to say, like, what are your thoughts on that? Because... You know, it's, it, I get it in terms of a marketing perspective, but it's also like a very dangerous play, especially as you were talking about in terms of like an edge. If you have an edge, eventually, by the sounds of it, that edge will end up expiring, yep. essentially. Yep. And therefore, you need to then adapt and learn or, or grow another edge or find another edge in the market. Absolutely. While when you think about this institutional strategies uh, that are being promoted, that alludes to the fact that it will never change. Yeah. Because essentially, the institutions won't change, right? That's how they trade. So right. Therefore, how dangerous of a mindset is that to a trader? <sighs> it's so dangerous. But again, if you're looking at what the purpose is behind it, the purpose is, is to, sell, to sell a strategy. The purpose is not to utilize said strategy. The purpose is to sell that strategy as an institutional strategy or whatever. Um, you know, so banks, I'll give it, <laughs> I'll put it to you simply here. Banks here, these are the smartest people in the world. <laughs> And they have the most, and they have all the capital in the world behind them. Mm -hmm. So even if a trade is not working for them, they can starve you out of your trade because they got time and money on their balance sheet. They literally have it on their balance sheet. You, do, you and I, we don't have time and we don't have a big enough bankroll, you know? So those factors alone will push us out of any trade eventually, mm -hmm. eventually, you know? And that's what these guys have. 
And that bankroll that fucking continues and continues and continues. And they can, they can, they can do a lot of fancy things that we can't do. For example, when they want to come out and buy 3 million shares of friggin' some stock, whatever the stock it is, they don't just go in the market and buy 3 million fucking shares. If they did, everybody would know it, and they'd push the price of the stock up just by themselves. Because nobody's going to go in the market, open market and buy 3 million shares. So what do you do? They have execution algorithms designed by, again, the top engineers and the top freaking neuroscientists in the fucking world that'll sit there and, and calculate, okay, how... How, how much can we not impact the market by buying this 3 million shares? And they have all the data in the world to prove, okay, if we do it this way, maybe buy 100 shares every uh, 10 minutes or something like that over a certain period of time, or we go on the dark pool, or you know, we use some other liquidity methods here that nobody else can, you know, that people can't see us, or we go into the options market. Um, you know, there's so many different ways that institutions can, can manage a trade and cut out risk that a retail guy would never, ever, ever be able to. For example, a retail guy who wants to buy, you know, who wants to get exposure on Tesla or Nvidia or something like that and wants to cut down his risk, he doesn't even have the account to sell options against his, his, his main position. That way he can cut down the cost of his main position, start gathering some income here while that trade is slowly working, mm -hmm. you know, in his favor or not in his favor. They don't even have the cash to be able to do that. So how the fuck are you going to call yourself an institutional trader? How? Please explain that to me. Somebody in the comments when this shit comes out, please explain <laughs> that to me. Um, you know, so again, institutions, they, are, they have access to games and people and connections that we don't. That we don't that we don't have access to, and we'll never have access to. Definitely, <laughs> you know. No, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. You know, when it's explained, it's so logical. But then I think it's just—is it just the human brain that just allows the illogical thoughts and, and ideas and promotion of things to well, overtake you, us? You know what they say, man. We complicate shit that ain't that shouldn't be that complicated. Mm -hmm. You know, because we're human. Yeah. Because we're human, and we'll complicate the, even the, the the most simplest things. You know, like. Waking up in the morning, or or walking, what you know, walking your dog, or having a simple relationship with your with your wife or, or your spouse or your kids or whatever it is, we'll complicate we'll complicate the shit out of all of it because we want different things, you know. We're not on the same page as as far as who we are, and we can't communicate. We don't want to communicate. We lie, we lie, we cheat, we do all these kind of fucked up things to each other for our own benefit. And that feeds through in so many things that we do, including trading, man. Yeah. yeah definitely. And in terms of uh, money, just to go back to money, for example, a lot of people struggle with getting used to the numbers as they start to hopefully progress through their journey. Sure. You know, they start off with, let's say, a few thousand, maybe into tens of thousands. But once they start to really start kicking into the six figures, multiple six figures, you know, the change in the risk amounts, sure. the profit amounts, sure. et cetera. Uh, it's something they struggle with. Is there anything that throughout your journey that allowed you to sort of adjust to those numbers or what was your sort of adjustment like? Yeah, it, it's just like the awareness thing and how you constantly have to be aware of it. You constantly have to plan. You constantly have to strategize. So now let's say you, you went from a 10 grand account to a couple hundred thousand, 300,000. Now your games are going to be different. Your P&L is going to be a little bit different. Um, you know, so you constantly have to reassess, okay, I achieved this, now what do I want? Okay, I achieved this, now what do I want? Because if you don't know and you don't put it out there, you're going to put that all up to risk. And now you're back where you started. You know? And that's the toughest part of this whole game. So as you stair step up, you want to make sure that you don't freaking slide all the way back down, you know? So one of the best things that I've ever done, of course, is just take the freaking P&L off the screen. It's probably one of the best things that you can do intraday while you're doing all this stuff, um, you know? But constantly making that assessment, constantly making that assessment. And again, you're not going to be 100%. None of you are going to be 100%. None of us are 100%. So sometimes, yeah, that big loss is coming around the corner. As soon as you make a couple hundred thousand, your losses are going to be bigger. It is what it is. And now your stomach has to, has, to get, has to get the pain tolerance. We were talking about the pain tolerance before. This is the only reason why we have so much of it. Because as we're stair-stepping our way up, shit, man, we might fall back down four steps and then take another year to go back up eight, you know? Um, and that happens in a trader's life all the time. So constantly being aware of where you are and where you want to go 
is the most important part because that'll help you align what you're doing intraday and, you know, over a couple of days to figure out, you know, where you're trying to go in the future. You know, for me, most of the time, like I'm a home run trader, like I'll, I'll shoot, I'll shoot and I'll shoot heavy, um, you know, because I'm looking for certain spots where the whole market changes. Everybody's trapped on one side of the trade and they have to get out. And if they have to get out, um, market makers also who are selling the options, they're also in the same position. Everybody's basically on one side of the trade now after everybody got trapped and lost everything, you know? So you'll see a lot of that happening in the markets these days. And, um, and it takes a while to develop, right? Because you have to trap everybody on the wrong side. Once you do that, there's enough force that, that all you have to do is drop some catalyst somewhere and that'll create that force on the other side. And that force will last a good amount of time. Mm-hmm. I want that, I want, I want that, you know, once that starts happening, because that's much easier to read. The problem is, is what do you, how do you, how do you position yourself to get there in the first place, right? Because you can't lose your whole ass by the time, by the time it comes around and now you're not here. You know, that's, that's a major issue. So I'll swing for the fences here when I see, you know, those things lining up. Um, you know, so for me, my goals are completely different than when I started out. When I started out, it was like, all right, how do we, you know, how do we make 100 grand? How do we make 200 grand? Once I did that, then it was like, okay, let's, how do we shoot for the millions? Once I did that, then it's like, all right, we don't even know what we want anymore because we didn't even think we were going to be here in the first fucking place. So then you have to go through that whole period of figuring out what's the next step and all that. Um, so it constantly, it's constantly adapting. Just being able to constantly adapt, being aware of where you are, and just listening to yourself, listening to the thoughts. Um, you know, and that's, that's it. Sometimes, it. sometimes that takes time as well. But anytime I'm not aligned with where I'm trying to go, my trading is off completely. Because I'm shooting at things I shouldn't be shooting at. I'm doing things that I shouldn't be trading. Because there's no, there's no, there's no sort of plan, so to speak. Mm-hmm. And there's no real end purpose. This is a very interesting thing that actually I was going to lead on to, which is that when you're starting out, especially, but people have this idea, and I had this idea. I'm not sure if you did, but I had this idea that once I reach X, Whatever, it could be money, it could be yep. um, you know, assets, it could be a certain goal, whatever. Right. Once I reach X, then I'll be happy. I would have arrived. It's bullshit. It's bullshit. <laughs> it's bullshit. I'm going to tell you why it's bullshit, right? Number one, you've been living that moment in your head mm-hmm. for years before you actually got there. <laughs> so your body and your brain is already... It already felt that years ago. It's actually felt that every single day because that's all you can think about every single day. Every single day, what do you do? You wake up and you're like, I want this, I want this, I want this, and I'm gonna do everything to get it. That's what you think about. You think about that every day. So now when you get it, when you actually get it, you've already been there. So it, there's no, it's almost no relief. You're just like, all right, what the fuck do I do now? <laughs> that's it, you know what I mean? Nobody really truly appreciates when it actually happens because there was so much sweat, blood, and tears that they've been mentally struggling with for years before they got there, you know? So if you're able to truly appreciate like, hey, I arrived, this is, this is amazing, you know? And now let's kind of, you know, back this up a little bit and figure out what's next. Usually what happens is, is that people get so, because they've been thinking about it for every single moment, waking moment of their lives, they think when they hit this number, everything's going to be fine. And then when it's not, then they start acting crazy. And they start acting crazy. Because, you know, I mean, rightfully so, right? I mean, you, you, you spent every single waking moment, all your energy on this one moment. The moment happens, and you're just like, well, what the fuck? <laughs> and all you're thinking about is what's next? That means your mind is already ready to struggle for two years or another however long for the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. It's exhausting, man. Mm -hmm. It's exhausting. It really is. So that means that when you arrive, you're fucking exhausted. You're already exhausted, Mm -hmm. you know? You just want to chill. And now that you don't have the the feeling, the joy that you thought was going to come with it, now that you don't have that, you're probably going to act like an asshole, Mm -hmm. you know? And that's what happens to a lot of people. It happened to me too, so I'm not here judging. I'm not holier than thou at all. All I'm saying is, this shit happened to me. 
hopefully, you know, it's different for you or, you know, maybe you can figure something else out. Definitely. In terms of uh, perspective, you know, a lot of people come into the markets and think, I'm going to master this shit in a year, two years, et cetera. Yeah. How important is it for traders to think on that bigger picture and that long term? And as I'm sure you'll probably oh. agree, is that you, it's easy to come in and we all could probably come into it thinking the same. Yeah. But like, how helpful is it to just think more longer term, Man, bigger picture than, if you're, than that? If you're able to think as a trader over five years or 10 years, the intraday shit you don't even care about because if you're disciplined again it goes back to uh the the reference to sports if you're a tennis player or basketball player or whatever like i'm gonna come in here and i'm gonna take my 500 shots every single day if i make some who gives a shit if i if i if i hit them who gives a shit i'm gonna do the same thing tomorrow i'm gonna do the same thing tomorrow i'm gonna do the same thing tomorrow that's the right attitude for anything in life for, if you want to achieve anything in life that is the right attitude and again we're so amazed by people that can do it because we can't fucking do it, right? The majority of people cannot do it. They can't wake up and do the same shit every day. Oh, my God, it's boring. Oh, my God, my girlfriend wants to do this. I got to make her happy. So, you know, I'm not going to do what I need to do every single fucking day. And my bad to blame it on the women. I'm not blaming it on you. I'm not blaming it on you at all. You're beautiful. However, distractions. Here, <laughs> distractions, this is what happens to most of us who are trying to achieve something. It could be any kind of distraction. So what ends up happening is we lose that discipline. We want things now. We want things a lot faster than they, watch the, when, what they, what they should come at. Some of us hit those things. But if they come fast, they're going to go out right as fast. We've seen that in history repeat itself time over time. But we still continue to deny it because everybody, you know, the new generation will keep coming along and gamble and gamble even harder than the last generation, you know, in the hopes of getting in there. It is what it is. Um, but if you can have the mentality of the five year, the 10 year kind of thing, you're untouchable. You're fucking untouchable. Because we're talking about a person who knows themselves, they know what strategy works for them, they're gonna continue to execute, and even if they fuck up, it's fine, it's fine. Because they got a five year outlook on this. Over time, they're gonna be fine, you know? If you can adopt that mentality, that is the right mentality to have. Unfortunately, we're human beings. There's different things that influence our time frame. There's different things that influence the amount of money we have. There's different things that influence all kinds of stuff. So the lifestyle that you lead may influence you to drop off that path just like that. You know, anything could happen in your life that makes you drop off that path just like that. Think of how hard it is to keep a gym routine, man. You go to the gym for a week and then you go to Columbia, you come back, you're like, well, well, I'm asked out for about two months, you know what I mean? <laughs> I'll make it back to the gym in about a couple of months, mm -hmm. you know? And then it's just, it's just that back and forth of it all mm -hmm. that gets very fucking tiring. But that's what this is. If you want to achieve anything, that's what it looks like. So you better fucking, you better get your pain tolerance up because that's all this shit is. It's just you doing something, you get knocked down, and you got to go back and do it again. Definitely. And you have, to, you have to find a way to enjoy it. You have to find a way to enjoy it because if you don't, now you're just tired. <laughs> mm -hmm. Now you're just tired and you don't want to do shit. And the easy way out, you already know what it is. You pull out that phone, you, 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 know, you hit the Oreos, you, hit the, you, know, you start smoking weed, you start doing all this kind of stuff. Who gives a shit about any of this stuff because I'm just fucking tired. Mm -hmm. I need a vacation from my life. Motherfucker, you haven't done anything. I need a vacation. I just need a vacation, mm -hmm. you know, because you're just tired. And that's what it is. You have to find that joy in all of it. You have to. <laughs> and, it's, and it's tough. I'm not going to sit here and say it's easy. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes you have it and then sometimes you're off. So that's life. So, I think that's what kind of we started with in terms of people wanting perfection all the time. And it's a, sure. it's a dangerous mindset to have. Yeah, man. And earlier you mentioned in regards to like, or we talked about uh, people complicating things. How, in terms of your strategy and, and you know, the traders that you've come across, how important is it to keep a simple sort of edge, a simple strategy within the markets? Yeah. Or is it okay to have a complex sort of viewpoint on the market? Um, I, think it's, I, think, I think the rule of thumb is keep it simple. And for me and my guys, everything is tape. Like tape will tell you what shit's doing. Tape will tell you everything. The question is, is are you reading it unbiasedly? Mm -hmm. And that's where we complicate things. So that's where the complications start coming in, you know? So you can come into the market and, you, and I can sit there and I can read tape. If I'm reading this tape without any bias whatsoever, I'm making money. Hand down, I'm making money. You know, I can figure out over time where some stock is going and make some money. 
But if I come in saying this is going to do this today or that is going to do this today or this is going to do this today because I want it to happen and it's time to happen and blah, blah, blah. And I come, I come to the market already complicating a situation that doesn't need to be complicated. This is where, this is where things start to happen. And then it just is a spiral here kind of, of consequences once you layer on your bullshit onto a market that is just moving because of buyers and sellers. All you're there to do is to read that movement. If you can get a read on it, make a fucking trade. If you can't get a read on it, don't make a trade. It sounds simple. That's why people will always, that's another marketing tool too. You'll see, you'll see people saying, okay, trading is simple. Trading is simple, you know? And when you put it out like that, it's simple, sure. But why is everybody losing money then? <laughs> you know what I mean? Because we complicate it because of what we want, because of the losses that we want to make back, because of what we believe should happen. You know, this is how we overcomplicate things. For, for me and for my guys, everything is, everything is just is purely tape. Are there people buying this stock? If so, can we get a price? If so, when are we going to sell it? And that's it. That's literally it. And that's, that's always what it should be. But is it like that? Most of the time, no, because we want more out of a trade. You know, we should have had more size, let's say. We didn't get enough size, so now we're pissed off at ourselves. So now we will buy more when we shouldn't buy more, and it's time to get out. You know, so we'll do all those stupid human errors here and complicate things because of what we want, you know. And that's a big, that's a major problem for most retail traders. Yeah. And... In terms of uh, risk and size, actually, you know, in the FX side in particular, a lot of people really emphasize 1% risk. Yeah. Know, or like fixed risk. Yeah. While I've been speaking to a lot of obviously options traders and, and just generally a lot of more successful traders, and they talk about dynamic risk. They talk about, you know, yes, uh, you know, have a, especially in the beginning, have maybe a general rule of thumb, you know, actually building up your tolerance, et cetera, and building yeah. up your skill set and your edge. But the best traders know when to size up. I mean, they don't just keep it fixed. When you play blackjack, if you're trying to make some money playing blackjack or you're trying to make some money playing poker, what, what, what money have you ever seen made where somebody doesn't take a big chance somewhere? You know, because they got the cards or the odds are in their favor. There's no, this ceases to, begin, to become a game now. Like the game doesn't even make sense from a numbers perspective. Forex is different because you get 501 fucking leverage. You get 201 leverage, so you can shoot around 1%, and you can still make a bunch of money here off that 1% trade because there's so much leverage behind it anyway. You know, options and equities are obviously a little bit different, and 100%, the best traders are concentrated traders. Concentrated meaning when it's time for them to take a shot, when that setup comes that they've been waiting for, damn it, you better get in there. You better, you better get up in there, you know? And if you don't hear, you've... You've spent all this time working and waiting on this trade here. You didn't make enough, you didn't make enough for it to cover back the losses that you took to find the fucking trade to begin with and to cover up all the mental capital that you spent to get there in the fucking in the first place. Come on. We're in this game for that. That's why we're in this game, you know? So that to me it comes with the game. Otherwise you're not otherwise it's, it ceases to become a game. You're just sitting there gambling. You know what I mean? And you're just not going to get anywhere. I mean, if you sit on a blackjack table with $1,000 and bet the minimum, what's the point? What is the point? I mean, if the point is to just have a good time, sure, go have a good time. But who's trading to have a good time? Who is, I don't even, I don't know one trader that is, that is there to have a good time. People go to the casino and sit on the slot machine to have a good time. Okay, fine. What trader do you know that is there to have a good time? I'm just happy to be here type trader and attitude. <laughs> There's not one fucking trader I know. If that's you, stop fucking trading. <laughs> you know what I mean? So at some point, you got to get concentrated. Yeah. You know, you got to find out where the sweet spot is. And when that time comes, that's your moment. Mm -hmm. That's your fucking moment. You got to go for it. You have to go for it. You know? And you, you've had those moments. In your Hell life. yeah, man. Those moments come like once a month, man. Mm -hmm. Once a month they come. Even sometimes even more. And... To get the confidence to be able to concentrate a position like that in the face of, of losses, let's say, in the face of everything that has happened to you in the past, it's, it's an even more difficult scenario here, too. Because you can't manifest that same blind faith, that blind faith that you could when you were 25 or 26. 
it's different now. You're 40. You got a family. You got, you got the kids. You got this. You got that. It's a different game now, Definitely. you know? So it's tougher to manifest that same concentrated position type of attitude mm -hmm. as time goes on, you know? So these are all the things that mentally you have to deal with. And after sitting there thinking about all this shit, who would want to do this? <laughs> who really would want to do this? It's mm -hmm. a tough game. It's a tough game for anybody. So how do you make it simpler? You know, have you done any automation at all? No. You've never done any automation? No. I feel for Forex, it's easier because the platforms are all API centric and then mm -hmm. you can build whatever the hell you want to kind of thing. In the, in the equities and options, it's a little bit different. There's a lot of compliance. They don't want you trading a lot of certain products. I think more so is because you see all these guys like fast pass uh, bots for, for mm -hmm. prop firms and mm -hmm. HFTs and then mm -hmm. generally people who have promoted bots in the past, they're mm -hmm. just always blown up in the end. So it's always just put me off thinking, oh, there's no longevity there. So it's more so maybe been put off by the Man. maybe uh, less... Man. Ethical people in the industry. Man, the funded simulation stuff is very... People think you can game it. I know you're out there right now. You guys think you can game it, right? Because you think you can pit one side against the other. And you, can, you think you can game a system that, remember, remember who's behind this shit. <laughs> you, need to, you need to understand who you're up against. These are, the smart, these are the same guys that created the whole game to begin with before, <laughs> right? And now it's all math. It's all pure math, right? So think of actuaries who create the math behind insurance products and things like that. Smartest minds in the world because, again, how do we ensure that if we sell these policies to everybody, we still make some money? It's still a fucking business. You still got to make some money here. You guys think you can crack those systems with your bots, with your this, with your that. But guess what? Eventually here, their whole system is to figure out where you guys are finding edge and to close that window on you, right? So now it becomes a game, it becomes an arm race, mm -hmm. right? It was just like, um, it's just like ticket scalping. What happened in ticket scalping and what happened with so many other systems like sneakers and shit like that is that you would have a bot that would essentially break a website and get into the website faster than anybody else, buy up all the inventory, and then you're able to go online and, and sell it. Now, if I'm the... If I'm the ticket master of the world, or if I'm the easy of the world, mm -hmm. you know, obviously word is going to come to me, and I don't, want, I don't want all my product to go to these freaking bots. I don't want my customers to get screwed and have to pay six times of value for my shit. Of mm -hmm. course, so I'm going to come in here and say something about it. I raise up to, the, to the, uh, uh, the primary market, which is the ticket master or the Adidas or whatever, and I tell them, hey, this is fucked up. You guys got to figure out what's going on, or we're going to move here. So now... They find you guys. They find you guys. They find the bots and they shut them down. They shut them down. Right now on the funded simulation, the, they'll allow all the bots to work on the phase one and the phase two. Mm -hmm. So they don't even give a shit. You do whatever the hell you want on the phase one, phase two. Once it comes to real money, yo, <laughs> you're done. You're done. Those bots are done. You know, and the ones that you're buying online for $200 or $300, you still got to know how to tweak them. You still got to know how to do shit to them. That's the whole game right now. And it's easier to just sell the bots, just like it is to sell the simulation, than to actually accomplish anything by, mm -hmm. by actually fucking trading. So guess what? At the end of the day, you still have to become a trader at some point, and you still have to know what the hell it is you're, you're, you're doing at some point. Mm -hmm. So uh, to your point about the, uh, the bots and everything, that's gotten really ugly. Um, I'm talking about automation that can kind of save you from yourself. That's what I've been working on. And I'm talking about how can we tell that Riz is about to lose 10% of his account, 20% of his account? How can we tell before it's happening or as it's happening so that we can implement some automation that can save himself from himself? Because we know over time, he's not going to make the right decision when it matters 100% of the time. Sometimes he will, sometimes he won't. But how do we save himself from some of those catastrophe moments? How do we save himself from some of those moments where he turns a big winner into a loser? How do we get real dynamic about our own emotions, tracking our own emotions from a data perspective so that we can build the right automation to help you save your ass, all right? Mm -hmm. So if I can give you automation right now that'll save you 30% of your losses over the year, what are you gonna tell me? You're gonna tell me no? <laughs> you know what of I'm saying? Of course not, no. How, how do you think that would, that would work in terms of, uh, would it be just tracking the sort of decisions being made? A lot of data. A imagine. lot of data. You're basically creating a brain. Exactly. Exactly. So we don't want to take the decision 
of what you want to do out of the equation. Mm -hmm. But we want to take the decision where it becomes very emotional for you when, and that always happens with oversizing. If you got too much size, it always happens with overtrading. If you're trying to make back losses, it always happens with uh, turning big winners into losers because you want more. Mm -hmm. It always happens at the most emotional parts of our decision making. How can we, how can we get enough data that we can see it coming mm -hmm. as it's happening and then implement the right automation to save you from yourself? at those moments in time where it's the most important. Mm. And over time, if I save 30% of my losses, do you know what that would look like, Riz? I can imagine it's insane. <laughs> <laughs> you know what that would look like? It would literally be tens of millions of dollars. Wow. You know? So if I, can, I, if I can elongate your career, if I can make your career as a trader longer just by you having that. No brainer. It's a no-brainer, mm -hmm. you know? So those are the things that I'm thinking about doing and, and trying to now implement because this is, oh, this is my world. This is where I live. This is, you know, these are the types of conversations I have all the time with my own guys. And, um, and again, these are, these are problems that are well-known problems that nobody really has solutions for. I mean, what is your solution, right? Let's say, what is the retail solution? What is the retail trader's solution right now to their emotions right now? What is their solution? It's Absolutely. only be better, yeah. right? <laughs> It's only be better, and we're talking about 1%, 2%, 3%. I mean, if you can get 3% better, what does that look like on your bottom line at the end of the year? I would imagine it's a decent amount of money, probably. Um, but how do you do that, right? And then when you ask somebody, how do they do that? Well, they'll say, I don't know, read some books mm -hmm. or work on my mental. How the fuck do you work on your mental, right? Who knows how to do that? What does that look like for people? Does that, what are you doing? You, are you meditating now in the morning? But even if you meditate in the morning, by 11 o'clock, you're pissed off at the world because you just, you, just, you know? <laughs> yeah. And now all that meditation went through the fucking window here, you know? So you call it whatever the hell you want to call it, you're still at risk for yourself, mm -hmm. you know? And then the other option is you learn how to code, but what's the likelihood of you learning how to code, right? Because it's not just, they make that shit look easy too. <laughs> okay, yeah, all we got to do is go on ChatGPT, tell ChatGPT, hey, write me some code to blah, 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 blah. Okay, it's there. It's getting there. I'm not mm -hmm. saying that's not an option. It is an option. It does take a lot of time, work, discipline to just sit there and try to figure it out. Plus, you got to test the shit out. They make error in the codes all the time. So you got to go back to ChatGPT, say, hey, where'd you fuck this up? Blah, blah, blah. You know, you still got a lot of things to do. Or you can teach yourself how to code. Now, if you teach yourself how to code, just because you read a book about Python, it doesn't fucking mean you can build a piece of software here that actually works. You st it's like art. Good coders, they're artists, man, with their code. That shit works in a lot of different environments, works under a lot of different APIs, works with different software. You know, that's a whole nother thing. Or you can pay another programmer. Now, what's the cost to pay another programmer? It's a fucking ass load of money. Mm -hmm. And then you want to store all that data, you want to save all that data, you want to track all that data. <sighs> All that shit costs a lot of money. So it's very cost prohibitive if you, if you want to go down that road. Mm. So what solution do we really have? And hence why you have a world uh, that is saying, hey, trading is easy. This is, a great this, is a great, this is a great way to make some side income. You can have the life you want. All that shit is being sold to you for fucking $20, for $20, $10. You think something that can be sold to you for $10 or $100 is going to change your life like that? Get the fuck out of here man but that's what that's what you're going on there and you're seeing every single day because now the value of that education everybody has it everybody has education everybody has it you can go online on youtube right now and get it for free get it for free you can get all of it for free mm -hmm. you know or you can pay 20 dollars for a fucking newsletter and this and that you don't even know what to pay for there's so much shit out there you know so if i was a new guy trying to come into this game i wouldn't even know what to, i wouldn't even know what to do mm -hmm. and my advice always to the newer guys is Get a fucking seat at the table and trade. That's the only way that you'll figure this shit out, you know? Because if you crawl down the rabbit hole of paying some, somebody else, including myself, <laughs> because I do have education as well, if you crawl down that rabbit hole, it never ends. Mm -hmm. It doesn't end. You're constantly going to want to pay for the next thing and the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. And that's what marketing is and that's what sales is. And we're at the peak of it in freaking trading right now. And yes. sometimes I look at it and I'm like, oh, it's so hard to be in this industry and be, you know, and even when you, you put out some losses, the hate that you get, the, 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 the bullshit that you get from people that just, you know, that just want to, you know, kick a man when he's down kind of yeah. thing. That's, it, it tells you a lot about us as human beings too. 100%.
especially how we act when nobody's watching and nobody can see us. Yeah, yeah. You know? Behind that wall. Behind that wall. That screen. And there's a lot of things that'll get exposed from a lot of these industries. We're already slowly starting to see it, but you know, it's, it's dangerous. It's, 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 tough. it's a tough kind of situation right there for newer traders coming in. You know, so again, I would say, hey, make the money in a, you know, go get a, go get a day job, make some cash, start small and work up, you know, and, and figure out the game that way. Definitely. Yeah. And this is kind of like a multiple part question, if you will, and uh, because it just kind of ties in all together. But, you know, going through your tweets and, uh, you know, yes, you have an education now, but what was the choice yeah. of just being so open throughout your career? So it's not yeah. like you suddenly went, oh, I want to be more open now. Yeah. You've done it. For, like, I've seen tweets from 2010, 2011, 2013. Yeah. Yeah. And not only that, but also during that time, those sort of years, there was like a theme going on where it was like, I'm gunning for that seven figure trade. Yeah. Gunning for that seven figure. And there were moments where you would tweet and say, could have had it today. Yep. You know, but I didn't size in. Yep. You know, it's such an easy seven figure trade for those who did the right things. Bingo. And it was just incredible to see that, you know, and I didn't get to see a tweet of like, if it happened or not, I imagine it did. Yep. Um, but like, what was those, those processes like? And what was the choice to be so open and just real when you could easily not be? You know, you could easily decide to go yeah. down the other route. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's a great question, Riz, man. That is, a, that is an amazing question. I think I started out in that mode. In the, okay, I'll put it to you this way. I started out not showing anything, and nobody knew what, obviously, nobody knew anything about me. Um, and then I wanted to like write, I started writing articles. Um, it was just satire. Because at the time, remember, this is 2010. CNBC, watching CNBC and reading Yahoo Finance was, was like a horrible experience. <laughs> like it was just the driest conversations. It was just the driest content. And there was no, memes hadn't even hit the street yet. Like GIFs <laughs> hadn't even hit the street yet. You know, now it's just complimentary. You get a complimentary meme or a GIF that explains whatever the hell you said in a tweet right after you put the tweet out there. Before it wasn't like that, you know. And I always had this kind of satire mindset anyway. So I would like write articles about, you know, Lucci upgrades and downgrades or something like that. And I would be like, buy Chipotle stock. I've never seen so many white people standing outside a fake ass Mexican <laughs> restaurant in my entire fucking life. And now all of a sudden, the franchise started with 10 locations and now it's over 2,000. You know what I mean? The stock IPO to $50. It hit $3,000 the other day. It hit 3,000. I think it hit... 3,500 or something like that the other day. And that IPO'd in 2000, I don't know, I don't know, 2006, mm -hmm. maybe? You know what I mean? And then like Lululemon, Lululemon was just starting out. I was like, buy these things because these girls' asses look incredible here in these <laughs> yoga pants, man. You get your girl, it's one of these yoga pants here. Um, you know, I would just do stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And that started creating a lot of traction. And that's where everything started to happen on Twitter, on stock tweets and everything. So then I kind of became this sort of personality anyway, and people enjoyed the financial comedy because it was, there was something comedic going on all the time. Mm -hmm. Even now, you know, you look at what happens in finance right now, but you look at FTX. I mean, <laughs> FTX, you could make movies for the rest of, <laughs> for, the, for the next hundred years on FTX about the characters that were involved in this, Sam, the girlfriend, all the prosecutors and everything, like all the shit that has happened between the time they got busted, even before, all the celebrities that got involved, everybody that was on the commercials saying, um, are you in? Remember Tom Brady, Tom yeah. Brady, and all these commercials, they would be like, yo, are you in? Are you in? They'd be making trades on fucking FTX US. You know what I mean? And then all of a sudden, this guy goes up, belly up. I, I still have... A half a million dollars sitting in FTX.com that I can't fucking get out, you know? Because it was in, you know what, you wanna know why I got in there? I shorted GameStop in FTX because they had a product, they had a futures product based in BTC. Basically thin air, complete thin air, but they gave you all this leverage just like they would on a Forex account. I couldn't do that on my regular account. I had like a $2 million account. If I wanted 50,000 shares short of GME, I didn't have the capital to put up for 50,000 shares and it was at $32 or $33. Mm -hmm. So I go to FTX, I'm like, you're gonna give me 50 to one leverage, so I'm just gonna put 100 racks in this, in this account or 50,000 or whatever the hell I put in. I shorted as much shares of GME as I could. I was like, even if I lose this 50 grand, I don't give a shit. It goes, to, it goes to 27, 26 or something like that. 
November 11th, the, the shit started closing down. And I'm like, no way. No mm -hmm. way. I'm up like 200 on the position. And I'm like, no way. I couldn't even sell out because the market maker stopped providing a market. So I couldn't even cover the position. Next day, shit's done. No withdrawals. Mm -hmm. You're asked out. End of December, stock trades $14. And there's, there's, one, there's $1.2 million in that account. Again, comedy, comedy. Mm -hmm. It's just gold in finance every single day. So that's kind of how I started out. And then I always kind of became this personality. And I think I got attached to that personality probably. Mm. And then I started to see an industry where other people were starting to share um, their stuff as well. Yeah. But then, of course, I noticed even back then, nobody, was, nobody, nobody shared their losses. Not one person shared their losses. So that was even back then. You know, and you would think a decade later, the shit's different. You would think, mm -hmm. you know, it ain't no different. <laughs> it really is. It ain't no different, you know. So you, you bring up a great point. It's the point of if the attachment to showing the P&L is too much so that, let's say I stopped and didn't and wasn't this personality and just traded. Would I trade better? You know, mm -hmm. would I trade significantly better? These are the questions. These are the questions. And I think that's a, an amazing question that I haven't been able to answer. And I think in the bottom of my heart somewhere, the answer is, yeah, man, just go ghosts. Forget about yeah. all this shit, you know, and just trade. That's it. You don't need all this stuff. You see, there's an element of the community there. Like the, the, 100%. Because the like, trading is a very lonely thing by yourself. You 100%. Know? I've always been the fighter for that type of community. I've even created like a, a space down in Puerto Rico where I'm mm. at right now. It's called Trade Space. And people can just come in, rent a desk. It's like a co-working space for mm. traders. And again, we're right next to the beach. I'm playing beach tennis all the time. People will come see me from all over the fucking world there, man. And they'll have friends from all over the world. So... What this business has done for me has afforded me the ability to do stuff like this, you know? So it's not nothing. It's not worth nothing. But the question is, what do you, what do you really want, mm -hmm. you know? And from you and the outside looking in at me, it was like, yo, does he really want to make money trading or does he want to be this guy, you know, this other guy? Can he do both? Mm -hmm. Is it possible to do both? And these are the questions that we have about each other. In reality, you can only answer that question about yourself. I can only answer this question about myself. But since we're here talking to y'all... You guys are getting the answers from us too, man. So yeah. I don't have the I don't have the the hundred percent answer for that, but I do think about that all the time. I can imagine. I, I no. do think about that all the time. But I think you're doing an incredible thing, and I think uh, you know, like we need that transparency in the industry. I think it's very helpful. I think it's especially now more than ever, as you've said, like we and and the rise of social media and the amount of perfection traders there seems to be. Yeah, is it's perfect to see an imperfect. Trader. Yeah, man. And I think it's something that is needed and necessary. And uh, yeah. hopefully we get to do this again because I'm sure we can go for hours and hours and I'm hours. I'm sure. Hours. I'm sure. It's going to depend on what country you land well, I'm gonna in next, you. I'm going to come to you. I'm going to come to PR, man. You're going to come to PR? Yeah. Dude, you guys, you guys got to come. Puerto Rico is a beautiful place, man. Definitely. I've heard. It I've is heard. a beautiful place. Um, but it's been an absolute pleasure. And I really appreciate you coming down Me and, too, and man. making this happen as well. Me too, man. And uh, everyone at home, the links for... Luchi will be in the, or Sang Luchi, should I say, will be in the description below. And drop a comment with your biggest takeaway from this episode. I know there was a lot, and that's what we love to do. Um, but yeah, take, drop a comment with your biggest takeaway from this episode. Make sure you hit subscribe. There'll be other episodes here on screen. But until next time, everyone, take care.